You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here with you for your murder mystery world tour. And Herds, I have the biggest grin on my face. I, I'm so excited. Oh my goodness. You're an absolute madman. We Flex. are discussing the last few chapters of The Devotion of Suspect X by Keigo Higashino, chapters 15 to the end. And Herds, I have to let uh-huh. you know. You are going to have to get all of your thoughts out in the first section of really? the show because the last is all mine. Okay. I have the biggest drama to share with you in the murder mystery world. <laughs> I've had professional <laughs> translation done. I've been researching this for weeks. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so ready. Herds, I'm how terrified. did you find the end of this book? <laughs> um, I mean, I guess we'll just jump right into it. This was a crazy ending. This might be the most twisty ending I've experienced that I was, like, genuinely confused by. Um, (laughs) how do I even put this? As I was reading it, I could see what the author was putting down. I could see, uh, mostly based off of how Kudo was, like, acting, who is a fool who stumbled at the finish line. Uh, I could see that things weren't going to end well when he, like, completely misread uh, uh, Yasuke Hanukkah's, you know, her disposition on what was going on. It's like, oh, yes, it is such a shame about the victim getting murdered when she's actually, like, torn up about Ishigami getting thrown in prison, which Mm -hmm. is what happens in this story. And he's, you know, tries to propose to her at the most, the worst possible moment. the worst possible. Kudo is the true villain of this story because he, by trying to rush Miss Yasuko Hanukkah into this decision of marrying him and choosing freedom and possibly happiness gets her sent to the slammer because she's an idiot. This ending is phenomenal because Ah, of this. Is it? It is. is, Here's the thing. (laughs) It is ridiculous Uh. how many things pack up on Yasko's shoulders, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Just the layers of torment are added moment by moment and so explicitly by Keigo Higashino. And there's a few of them that are ridiculous. I think that Kudo asking to marry her is definitely the most ridiculous of the bunch, Mm -hmm. okay? But because you are so just caught up in how horrible this moment is for her, you just... You just accept it because her finding out that, well done, Herds, Ishigami killed a homeless man to disguise the crime. It wasn't the character I thought it was, though. It was the engineer who was murdered. But at least the can man got away. That's the main thing. At least the can man got away and was instrumental in solving the case. Indeed. That's why he is a main character in the story. Then Yasko finds out that her daughter tried to commit suicide. Which is madness. Absolute madness. madness. All right. Then Kudo tries to ask her (laughs) to marry him. It's just, it's agonizing. I felt pain. It's a misery simulator. I, like. I don't want to say that this section was well written because <laughs> honestly, it is the clunkiest part of the whole book, but it has earned it. <laughs> yeah. I, look, I want to be very clear here. Like I was, I followed everything that happened. I don't think that it, you know, that the, the ending wasn't earned in a sense, but gosh, flex. I'm sick of you giving me these novels where everything's just miserable at the end. <laughs> Like, wh- why is this? These are my least favorite kinds of novels. Like, I-, I like tragedy, okay? I like it when characters are sad and like, well, it's a shame that that guy died, but at least we have each other. But literally, nothing could have gone worse <laughs> by the end of the novel. Everything that Ishigami did was for nothing. It was all nothing. Oh. And like, thematically, it makes sense because his whole thing is that he yes, can't, yes. you know, pay attention to the emotional side of things. He's very logical. Da, 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 da. And, and, you know, then the woman's like, I'm going to do an emotional thing and hand myself in to the cops and tell them everything, which is its own kettle of fish. But look, point is, everything was awful at the end. Even, does, what happens to Masato? Does she, is she in prison too? I think she's in prison as well. Isn't she, like, in high school? Ugh. Why, Flex? Why do you pick these novels? This was very explicitly... Revenge for the Dwarf. That's garbage. No. I will not spoil (sighs) the ending of the Dwarf here on this episode, but I read the ending of this book as I was just kind of reading it to see if it would fit the show. No. And I I smelled blood in the water. (laughs) I knew I knew this was this was what I wanted out of the end of the dwarf herds. I I wanted this pain. I wanted everyone in prison at the end of it. And I decided to drag you through it with me. 
No, let's go read the dwarf again. <laughs> this is miserable. This is the problem, right? I, I try to be objective on this on this show. I try to talk about you know the merits and the negativities. But like my mind is filled just with how much I despise the ending of this novel because of how just how awful it is. Um although I will admit I got a little bit of a chuckle when uh when Ishigami he does the sad, like, anime villain thing when he's, like, yep. cheek is up. He, like, clutches his head. And they said, I said out loud to a vacant room, I said, he's going to howl. And then he howled, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> and it ends there. It cuts to black at the best possible That's- point. <laughs> That's the last he does. He howls because everything he's done, all the sacrifice for nothing. And that's just the end. That's just it. That's it. We're, we're done here. I'm out. It is honestly phenomenal how well this book carries through its methods to the end. There is not a single moment in this book that I was thinking to myself, why is this here? Sure. Everything felt so purposeful. Even the clunky bits, I knew it was just to ramp up that pain in the most engaging way possible. The fact that it is ambiguous nearly to the end, whether or not Yukawa even actually knows what is going on, helps build the tension so excellently. Because when we sit down for that chat between Yukawa and Yasko, just the constant cuts back between his narration and her perspective are just so gripping. Though I do have hurts. Yeah. On reread, Uh, one complaint. What's the complaint? There are three breakdown scenes in a row. The crime is explained to us three times in a row. And I will say, on first read, it went straight over my head because I was so engrossed in it. But on a reread, I'm like, why? Yeah, We get it. We know what's happened. The thing is, is it does add more detail in each, each, in each version. And it is very important, the detail that it adds. But I think that it was written for television. Like, Maybe. It, it's clearly meant to be, you know, the the scene of Yukawa's version of events, the scene of Ishigami's version of events, the scene of the discussion with Kusanagi, all one after the other as we pick together the crime. But it, on a reread, at least, uh, it, it drags in a kind of weird way because I know that I need that information to make the ending work. But it is it is a little strange that it, he, uh, that, that Higashino felt the need to put the scene in its entirety three times over. Yeah. Well, the weird thing about, um, I, I guess, well, I, I could pick either, I guess Kusanaki scene is that it's nested within the, the Yasuko Hanuka scene. Like Galileo shows up to Yasuko's house. He's like, let me tell you what happened. And he begins telling her what happened. And then he says, and then I told her the same thing. I told Kusanagi and then it switches to us telling Kusanagi, but then he comes back and tells Yas. It's very, it's kind of weird. Yeah. And it cuts back to the two characters, but like not in a way that flows very well. Yeah. That's why I think it was written for television because it's clearly meant to be them on the bench. Then cut back to previously when he was talking with Kusanagi, then cut back to the bench, flashback, but it flashback. doesn't work so well because of just how those final scenes are paced out. And, and again, I'll, I'll say it one more time. The, the fact that I didn't notice it so much on the first read through means that it is it is probably fine, but it is the one thing that definitely stands out on a reread. You yeah, know, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Like on the whole, though, like this is a very um, a very character driven novel, and I think that particularly going to pick over the scenes between Galileo and Ishigami, it's 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 sort of spelled out to you the line where he says that there is no useless cog except in the way that it is the, the way that it is used or that it chooses to be used. And it's indicating that he knows that the homeless man was used to fake the body of, of Togashi, right? Yeah, because like Cog that being is. engineer. Exactly, right? exactly. But uh, there's been plenty of scenes like that, you know, between Galileo and Ishigami, between Galileo and Kusanagi. Like, all these characters have had these very cryptic scenes where we sort of have implications and, and, and you know, little bits and pieces of the story, um, or at least the way that characters are interpreting the story kind of told to us, but... I imagine that going back through and reading the whole thing, um, they're like trying to pinpoint the moment where, where um, Galileo actually solves what's going on 
you know? I mean, there's obviously the, the big breakdown at the end of chapter 14, but trying to figure out what he knows at every specific moment, I think would be quite an interesting exercise to try and walk through. Yeah. And I, I think especially going back, and we mentioned it last week, some of the more subtle clues, like just things not being mentioned, which is actually a really interesting game that Keigo Higashino plays, where he just puts he puts something out so obviously because it is explicitly the omission of facts that he uses it works so much more subtly than it otherwise would be. And I, I think that it really plays into what you were saying there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much you would dive into the mystery side of things yet, but I I, I know that one of the big discussions is about the, the dates that the murder actually occurred on. This is something that I had sort of picked up on thematically, but yeah. I think that in a weird way, my own... Because I'm I'm not great with details. I tend to get them mixed up in my head. So I was much uh, more easily able to pick up on the fact that the date was being omitted, but not specifically what the dates were, I suppose. Yeah. Like the, the fact that I, I actually have trouble remembering the specifics of these details worked in my favor in a, in a weird way. Yeah. Because the, the thing that's really nice about that clue is that it, it never really actually tells you the date. What it gives you is that... Ishigami took two days off, yes. and that is implying to you that there were two crimes, because it is said that he doesn't take days off normally yeah, well, to begin with. I read that scene and I assumed, okay, so the first day was the day when the first, like, when the actual murder happened, because why else would he have taken a day off if it wasn't part of the story? So I, at that point, had completely forgotten what the dates were. Like, my brain just didn't care. I just thought, oh, two days, so he was doing something the day after, which means that he was probably off doing something else important, thus a second murder. Yeah, I, I, I think, Herds, though, unless you want to argue yourself out of a point, you've gotten both for this book. I'll take them. I think you did an, I think you did an excellent job picking up on the, the extra victim. I think you did an excellent job of picking up on what was going with Ishigami and kind of the structure of things right from the beginning. You did go on a bit of a dovetail <laughs> uh, about Ishigami masterminding the whole thing <laughs> from the beginning, but you know what? I'll forgive you because that's obviously what Keigo was yeah. trying to make you well, believe. That's, well, that's the thing. That's what Ishigami kind of does. Oh, my goodness. That's my favorite know, part of the story. I know. It's phenomenal. How have we spent so many minutes talking about this, and I haven't even mentioned, that's my favorite part, is that you you start off with Ishigami, and he seems creepy and weird, and he's obviously, like, the point that uh, that Hinoshino was making is that these people who you know seem mad or different or crazy are actually much more down to earth than you expect, right? Yeah. Like, the homeless man, oh, my goodness. That's, oh, there's so many things I need to talk about. I hate this. But, like... The fact that he presents himself as a psychopath because he knows that he can, because he is very aware of himself and how he himself acts, he's able to play that to his advantage. And uh, I also love, this is something that's only implicitly stated, the the fact that he, in his logical, mechanical brain, says, uh, in, in his mathematics side of things, that the homeless man, the engineer, his value is worth less than Yasuko and Masato. And this is both an objective fact of like one life is worth less than two lives in his mind, but also- Do you let Ishigami pull the lever for the trolley? Yes. No, I mean, I don't let him. I push him out of the way. I don't trust <laughs> that man. But it's also um, a, a sign of, despite the novel saying to us that he is a purely logical man, it's also his subjective emotional side seeping in. He values those two ladies more because they're the ones who stopped him from committing suicide. So he's got this really interesting uh, middle ground where, despite the entire story saying, you know, he's logical, he's logical, he's logical, he won't let emotion cloud his judgment, the entire premise of the story relies on him being the emotional guy, like on the inside, he has this very uh, fragile emotional side of him um, where he places this absurd amount of value on these two women, which I really love that. It's fantastic. And I think the other thing that's really great about this ending is, you know, for me as someone who, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm just out for blood herds, but I know you are. I always like when the criminal gets caught in the Boo. end. I don't think that they deserve to get away with Boo. this crime. And Love there's though. something nice. There's something nice about the fact that Yasko did the right thing. No. In my humble opinion. No, she did not do the right thing. She should have kept living, gonna live with Kudo. Her daughter could have not been locked up in prison. Not with Kudo. No, Kudo's a bad op. Bad he's, op. Not, he's not a great op, but like, look, it's better than nobody. <laughs> I'm just saying, Masato does not deserve to be locked up in prison for no, an entire I life. No, I don't think Masato does. 
but that's that's another kettle of fish, and that also gets mm-hmm. into the court cases, which don't happen in this book. But I, I do think that uh, Keigo Higashino has done an excellent job crafting an ending that divides the line between us as wide as it possibly can mm-hmm. go, Herds. For sure. Anyhow, we are discussing chapters 15 to the end of Keigo Higashino's The Devotion of Suspect X. Stick around because at the end of the show, we are going to be breaking down the enormous drama that happened around this book over in Japan. I'm so excited. We are Flex and Herds. This is Death of the Reader, and you're listening to 2SER. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here with you for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are discussing Keigo Higashino's The Devotion of Suspect X and Herds. Flex. (sighs) If you were to present me with a Wikipedia page and say, Felix, you could have anything on this Wikipedia page for Death of the Reader, you would end up with the third point of Japanese Wikipedia's The Devotion of Suspect X. Oh no, what is- Because, Herds, there is a heading on this page- Uh Uh-huh that talks about the controversy surrounding the classification of the devotion of Suspect X as an authentic detective novel. Huh. That's crazy. It is. Of course it is. There's a detective and a murder. Now, here's the thing, Herds. I, did, I didn't know until we got into our Japanese stretch of our murder mystery world tour how much the Japanese murder mystery community puts into the rules of detective fiction to break... Knox and Van Dyne are not just offensive and not just not well to do, but a controversial. Interesting. Interesting. Because there was a list, according to our translator, John Luke Gallo, who has helped me out so much over the course of these past few weeks, the Honkaku Mystery Top 10 list, which lists some of the best authentic, which is to say fair play, murder mystery novels in Japan. And Devotion of Suspect X made the number one spot. Interesting. But detective fiction author Nikaido Reto made a post on his personal blog. And I need to I need to let you know, this post is enormous. It's like 8,000 words or more long when translated to English. That's too many words. And you read the whole thing? I've read the whole thing. Nice. And it is a breakdown of every detail of this crime and why it is not a fair story. And- Listen, shout out to Nikaido Reto for doing this because it is a thoroughly entertaining read, though I did have to dig back into internet archives to actually find it because it has since been removed from the website. Uh-huh. But he claims, he claims that Keigo Higashino intentionally concealed clues that would otherwise enable readers to solve the mystery on their own. Now, Herds, as someone who solved the mystery on their own, do you agree with this statement? I'm going to say no, I guess. Uh-huh. I don't know. I, I, I've I, managed to figure most of it out. Um, granted, it was mostly through, like, understanding of the themes and characters and not really through, like, hard evidence. Is that is that where, the, where this, this article kind of pushes towards? It or? more or less does go in that way. It essentially kind of makes the case that since Yukawa doesn't actually really know what happened, there is no evidence uh, so much as okay. inference that led him to figure out what the case is. Interesting. That it is not a fair novel. Now, they're, they're, they're actually, and here's where the exciting part comes in, Herds, is that there are actually camps of people for and against this book's inclusion as the number one fair mystery of 2006. Kasai Kiyoshi and some supporters online continue to say that it is an authentic mystery novel and deserves that grand prize, despite agreeing that it does not read like a traditional detective novel, which I think we can agree on. I'm down for that. I'd agree with that. But the thing that excites me so much about this is the divide between the two sides seems to be on whether or not Yukawa is important to the solution of this case. Interesting. Okay. Because Yukawa clearly at the end of the story doesn't have enough hard evidence to go on to actually lock anyone up. That's why he has to get Yasuko and Ishigami to confess. But the fun thing is, is that Nikaido is basically saying, as far as I have understood from this article, that because Yukawa's perspective is hidden from us as the audience, because we don't know the evidence that allows him to make these assertions, because we don't even know for sure though implied, 
that Yukawa is correct. Sure. Thus, it cannot be a fair mystery novel. Whereas I, and I believe Kasai Kiyoshi would make the same case here, would argue that Yukawa is actually something that the audience is meant to solve rather than being the traditional detective who, according to the rules of detective fiction, Knox, number eight, the detective must not light on any clues which are not instantly produced for the inspection of the reader. I think that's where the divide is, Herds. And I think that we are meant to solve Yukawa rather than Yukawa solving along with us. I mean, sure, I'd, I'd agree with that. Like, as we were saying in the previous part, there's a lot of moments, there's a lot of moments where uh, Galileo Yukawa, like, w- will say something about, you know, this is something that he's kind of conjectured or, or some clue that he's, uh, he's, he's pontificating on, but he won't explicitly state was it what his conclusion is. He's more trying to lead you. He's more of an author insert, I guess, than a traditional detective. Um, also, something that that I will think is is interesting. Um, the the problem here that, that that these people are saying is that there's not enough hard evidence. Whereas I thought that was part of the point that yes, Ishigami uh, even has this conversation with Galileo that you know that there is no way for you to solve this crime. And they said, well, yeah, but we'll like we'll find the body, like the real. Togoshi body eventually, and then we'll just have to do a DNA test, and then we will have the evidence. I feel like that's like the tension there. Um, I, I suppose the argument that I'm making is not that it's like traditionally fair, um, but that it, in the ways that it does subvert your expectations of what is and isn't evidence, um, that a a theory a ra- made around evidence is 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 more a part of this novel than actual hard like physical evidence. Um, that it serves the tension and the story of the novel in a way that I think is is acceptable. Absolutely. The other interesting thing that this article brings up is Van Dyne, who we have covered extensively on the show, both in the Benson murder case, the Kennel murder case, uh, and also just bringing up his rules all the time. But Van Dyne is another example of an author who has on multiple occasions lent on the idea that the detective doesn't know and has to draw a confession out of them. And it's kind of interesting because I think that there's something just about the portrayal where we know the criminals all along in this story that can make it feel like like the novel is being less fair than it is. And if anything, I want to credit Keigo Higashino for that because the idea that you feel like you're so behind when you are actually being given all of the information, yeah, it, it's such an excellent trap to play and is such a departure from the normal methods of uh, of what I see authors do. Normally, it's throwing in evidence that, you know, is either a red herring and doesn't get used or is misleading. But there are no loose threads in this novel. I went back with a marker through my copy uh, and I noted down every single piece of evidence that I thought uh, could apply and then ticked it off once it had been used. And there was not a single one I can think of that didn't apply. It is so brilliantly efficient. And the fact that it diverts you so well by just twisting that premise ever so slightly, but in such an impactful way, it's a method that I'm surprised I haven't seen catch on more. Yeah. I mean, definitely the, uh, the more circuitous routes I think is, is very, you know, it's very compelling. It's very different. And I guess that's part of the fun of getting to dig into these, you know, these, incredibly well-known Japanese murder mysteries, right? Um, now that we have them, you know, being translated into English, we really get an opportunity to experience a completely different side of murder mysteries, especially uh, as we come from, you know, like Sherlock Holmes having their influence on on Japan initially and seeing how, how the cultural spin kind of takes hold, I guess. Yeah, and I think the other thing on that front is having gone back through all of the evidence, the fact that it is all used says to me that this is by its nature, a fair mystery. It is a cruel mystery in terms of how you have to solve it because there are assumptions that you have to make, but I think that there are assumptions that Yukawa also had to make. And even though Yukawa, his observations are not instantly produced for the inspection of the reader, it's actually Kusanagi that is our Noxian detective in that sense. And we are still presented more than Kusanagi to allow us to solve both Ishigami and Yukawa's case. And I think the really, really fun thing about that, just from a thematic perspective, is that this is clearly a showdown between uh, Ishigami and Yukawa. And by framing it this way, where we're not actually given all of the clues as Yukawa sees them, 
it means that we actually become a third player in that game as opposed to Yukawa's sidekick. And that's fun. For sure, for sure. It requires a much more active participation, I think, in the story in order to put everything together. The one thing I did want to discuss with you, Herds, when it came to actually solving this mystery, and we mentioned earlier that there is the absences, and that's part of how you're meant to solve this case. But the one thing that I did notice that was really interesting uh, that we touched on as well was the just complete absence of dates through this story. It's always March 10th, March 10th, March 10th, March 10th. It's beating you over the head with it in a way that you start to just even black out the other, the idea that there are even other days on the calendar. I, I definitely did. I definitely was not even thinking about what the date actually was. Just this idea of two days, like I could see that was important. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do terribly with time puzzles the best of time. Time, I shouldn't have said it that way, but you know, you should have said I, it that way. I'm proud of I you. Definitely, it was an I, excellent joke. I've definitely ruined everything. <laughs> uh, my brain, especially, but yeah, like I, I do terribly with time puzzles. So for me to uh, simply have to grab onto these sort of basic logic puzzles, I think also that, and I'm, I'm sad I didn't bring this up um, sort of last week. The, uh, the, ex- the way that Ishigami talks about setting Test papers, I think, was also an excellent clue um, that he'll disguise one problem like another problem. That was um, that was the one that I was hoping you'd fish out at the end of last week when I asked you about that. I didn't think of that as a mathematical theorem. That's I, just I, like I, how I, I she didn't, I didn't want to lead you so. right to the right what? to the answer there. <laughs> what do you want from me? What do you want from me? I Flex? think you I did an excellent tell. job. It's not I like any of tell. them were disconnected from the case because they all were. I was just wondering. Wondering if it was as much of a linchpin for you as it was for Yukawa. Look, I don't, I don't want to learn no math anyway, okay? <laughs> she, I'd be a terrible student. I'm one of those guys who's like, math is great on my piece of paper, and then I and then I pass. The comparison I did want to draw there bringing up the date problem is that on reflection, it actually reminds me that it is kind of a parallel to the discussions about mathematical theories we've been having all along. The idea that the number is just a distraction The idea that, you know, all of these discussions that we've been having about these intense theories when it's actually about the character tension and the date is the exact same thing. It's just this beautiful parallel that it took me so long to clue into, but is almost a piece of evidence in itself for just how cleanly it ties in. And all I want to say at the end of this, Keigo Higashino, if you ever hear this, I'm proud of you. As a mystery nerd who spent so long reading through and solving these novels. There have been novels that I have loved as much as this, but nothing, nothing has pulled a murder mystery, a murder mystery that I have enjoyed nearly as much as this one. So Herds, we are approaching the end of the year and I am so glad (laughs) that we came across this, even though we nearly went to points and lines, which we still hopefully will do in future. But Points and Lines has still not arrived in my mailbox, Herd, so that means- Oh no, I'm going to have to solve it now. Oh no. That means you, sir, have a mystery to pick for us. I do. I've actually gone with a pretty traditional uh, uh, option, I suppose. Uh, It's one that comes highly recommended. I've decided that we are going to be checking out the Honjin- Murders, uh, run by Seishi Yokomizo. Ah. Uh, it comes as one of the highly regarded fair play murder mysteries. So yeah, it got a name drop in that I, article. I it unfortunately didn't spoil anything, yeah, but uh, it did get a drop. Uh, yeah, I figured after a story about love and how it drives you to do the darndest things, uh, we we do a murder mystery that takes place at a wedding. So that's fun. I'm looking forward to this. This can only go well. We'll be reading chapters one to seven. Fantastic. Herds, I'm ready. I'm ready to solve that wedding for you. Another love problem you've given Something me. Something like that. I think, I think you're out for blood as much I... as I was here, Herds. <laughs> I look, it's thematically appropriate. Uh, I, I will not comment on the tragedy of the situation, but I, I hope you enjoy. Uh, there's blood on the snow to be had, so I look forward to the Honjin murders next week by Seishi Yokomizo. Now, Herds, one... Final thing before we go, here in this article, yeah, I have discovered that apparently there is a group of people in Japan who, admittedly, I don't know the correct Japanese pronunciation of this, but I will, I will just go with the English translation. People who are called the demons of detective novels, such as professional writers, critics, and readers of the genre. So, herds, I'm just saying, I, I, I don't think I have quite demonstrated it just yet, like you did with this novel, but. 
I think you might have earned yourself the title Demon of Detective Novels. I'm okay with that. I'm down. <laughs> Look, I'm in. <laughs> You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and the Demon of Detective Novels herds himself. Oh no, why would you do this to me? Here on Death of the Reader, we will see you next week with the Hanjin murder case. You're listening to 2SER.